Church, I have to tell you, these last couple of weeks, your singing has been phenomenal. I, not, not that it's not good usually, but I just, you know, sometimes you just kind of have that stretch where you're like, wow, your heart's been in it in a way, in a very special way these last couple of weeks. At least it sounds like it from my end. God bless you for opening up your heart and your voice to praise Him. I want to begin... In, with, with something a, a little unorthodox, a little out of, out of my, normal, my normal practice, I'd like to play a video clip, it's about two and a half minutes long, just a straightforward interview that took place in our nation's capital um, within the last couple of months. Uh, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that some of you have perhaps already seen it, you know about it, and if you don't, then you will. What you're about to see is a committee hearing on the nomination of this man. His name is Russell Vaught. He is the nominee for the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. He's not been approved yet for this position, but, uh, but he is a Christian in the broad sense of the term, attended Wheaton College, which I believe is a, a Baptist-based school, writes for them and their alumni things periodically. And in this questioning, he's being questioned by Senator Bernie Sanders, a name that you'll probably know if you paid any attention to the last presidential election process. Um, and, and the questioning uh, gets pretty intense. But I want you to see it. I'll explain why here momentarily. But again, it's about two and a half minutes. So, uh, gentlemen, if you would go ahead and, and hit that for me, I'd appreciate it. And that is in the piece that I referred to that you wrote for a publication called Resurgent. You wrote, Muslim, quote, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. End of quote. Do you believe, do you believe that that statement is Islamophobic? Absolutely not, Senator. I'm a Christian, and I believe in a Christian set of principles based on my faith. Uh, that post, as I stated in the questionnaire to this committee, was to defend my alma mater, Wheaton College, a Christian school that has a statement of faith that includes the centrality of Jesus Christ for salvation, and... Again, I apologize. I do Forgive me. I, we just don't have a lot of time. Do you believe that people in the Muslim religion stand condemned? Is that your view? Again, Senator, I'm a Christian, and I wrote that piece... Well, what does that say? the statement of faith of Wheaton I College. understand that. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America. I really don't know. Probably a couple of million. Are you suggesting that all of those people stand condemned? What about Jews? They stand condemned too. Senator, I'm a Christian. I, I understand you are a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion, but there are other people who have different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that, that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. And in do you think your statement that you put into that publication, they do not know God because they've rejected Jesus Christ the Son and they stand condemned, do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator, I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ in salvation. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. I will vote no. Senator Gardner. Now, Listen, I, I know that clip probably, if you're like me, when I saw it, it stirred up 
all kinds of emotions. But before we go any further, I, I, I want to explain something. I don't show you that clip to try to stir up your American patriotism. I don't show you that clip to try and enter into a bashing session of any political party or any political figure. That's not the point at all. I show you this clip because as people of faith, as Christians, we need to realize that there are some things that we have typically talked about as theoretical or hypothetical. Scenarios you might possibly one day face, but realistically you probably won't. Well, that's how we've usually talked about them, but they're real. They are real. This happened at the highest levels of our nation's government. In a nation that typically has not had this kind of, uh, of confrontation in, in this way. Now, listen, I know that in a group of 193 people here tonight, we go to different workplaces. You, we, we have different circles that we tend to be in day in and day out. Some of you have probably seen encounters of this nature a lot. Some of you don't. In fact, there's a real good chance there's some of us sitting in these pews. We've never actually had this kind of encounter that would call faith into question to this magnitude. And some of us, some of us church, I, 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 I fear that perhaps we have deceived ourselves into thinking something to the effect of, well, you know, I bring my family to church at least once a week, and because we come to church, that's going to be enough for my kids and my family to never actually be affected by all this just because we at least make sure we attend regularly. And if that's the way that you think, you, you've been deceived. Because this kind of stuff is affecting not just people who have no faith, but it's affecting people who have had faith run through their family generation after generation after generation. Now, no doubt, as you watch it, you can probably think of numerous lessons, numerous points that need to be made in light of this type of an encounter. Tonight, I want to pick one, all right? Because I could go on for a long time, but I just want to pick one tonight. I want us to discuss the, what is now the mainstream idea that all religions are equally valid, and that all world religions are deserving of equal acceptance and equal value of all the others. Now, I'm not going to focus necessarily on the idea of denominationalism. I know that within our own ranks, that is a conversation that, that needs to be talked about a lot, and we have spent a lot of time talking about it throughout the years. I'm not, I don't, I'm not talking about necessarily denominationalism, although the principles we're going to discuss apply the same way. I'm talking about world religions as a whole because there's a lot of them out there that our, that our family and our kids and our societies are being exposed to. How do we get to this point? What is it that has, res that has transpired in our nation, perhaps in our world, that has led us to this kind of conclusion? Well, the, the truth of the matter it is a, go ahead and flip to the next slide, please. It is a product of what sociology calls multiculturalism. Now, that, that term was coined back in around 1935 when one of the biggest discussions in our country was the idea of immigration taking place and, and, and all of these various cultures coming in and becoming part of the melting pot bringing their different cultures, characteristics, and putting them in pot, and it all being boiled down, and, and those people assimilating into American culture. 
Merriam-Webster's dictionary will define this term multiculturalism as relating to or made up of several different cultures. That's just a straight definition of it. Now, as time has gone on, over the, since, since the coining of the term, what's that, 70, 80, 80 or so years? In the last 80 or so years, there's been a shift in its definition. Britannica.com said this about multiculturalism, that it is the view that cultures, races, and ethnicities, particularly those of minority groups, deserve special acknowledgement of their differences within a dominant political culture. Do you see the difference? It's not just the idea of being mixed together, but that they all stay separated. And to, to, to add one more scholarly journal for you, this comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Regarding multiculturalism, that document said, while the term has come to encompass a variety of prescriptive claims, it is fair to say that proponents of multiculturalism reject the idea of the melting pot in which members of minority groups are expected to assimilate into the dominant culture in favor of an ideal in which members of minority groups can maintain their distinctive collective identities and practices. So again, as opposed to assimilating into the larger culture uh, as a whole, every small individual minu minority group or majority group stays their own separate thing. You just put a bunch of pieces together, you don't make one big group. Now, again... I'm telling you this not because I'm trying to get political. No doubt you can hear overtones of things that, you, that, that we talk about a lot in our culture right now. I'm not telling you this to get political or to go off on that kind of a, on that kind of a tangent. I bring this up because this is the mentality that has permeated every single nook and cranny of our culture. And I mean every single place of our culture. This mentality is the basis for sociological studies and education systems. This idea of multiculturalism is a driving force behind political campaigns. It is, it is impacting the way that people think about everything, including religion and spiritual matters. The idea that every culture is supposed to stay defined and distinct instead of conforming to an ultimate standard for that society. Now what happens when you take that mentality and bring it to religion? What's going to happen? Let me tell you what happens. You wind up having the same philosophy applied to spiritual thinking. And what you have is that there is no single standard of spiritual belief that all people should conform or submit to. Every religious system, every religious idea is unique and legitimate and equal to all the others. It's a byproduct, a consequence of what multiculturalism has become in our country and in our society. The problem, when, especially when you start talking about this in spiritual terms, and that's where our focus is, the problem is that such a conclusion is utterly and preposterously illogical. It is not a rational conclusion that all religions are equally valid. God designed us human beings to be reasonable creatures. Now, you may question that based upon some people that you know, but I, I promise you, God created us all to be rational thinking individuals. We have the capability of connecting dots together and drawing rational conclusions when all the pieces and all the evidences and all the arguments have been laid out. And the idea that all religions are equally valid is illogical. You cannot have contradictory positions, contradictory beliefs and practices that all result in correct conclusions. That's like walking into a math class and saying 2 plus 2 is 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
We know that it can't be that way. And church, hear me when I say that if, we, if we're seeing this mentality sneak into our congregations, and if this is sneaking into our families, we've got to stop it. We've got to stop it. Somehow we have to put a halt on this idea. So what do we do? Do we just throw all religion out? I mean, that's, that's what some people say. Well, you know what? None of you religions can get together. None of you can, can agree altogether. You're all going to say, you all say the other one's wrong, and none of you actually says any of the others are right, and so here's what you've got to do. You just need to throw it all out. That's what the atheistic community would say. But we don't want to do that either. Because throwing all religion out... Well, that's just as illogical to say that because some or a lot of religions are wrong, then that must mean that all of them need to go. That's not a logical conclusion either. No, we don't throw out religion as a whole. But listen, here's what we also don't do, church. We don't bash. We don't belittle. We don't throw people under the bus for the sake of trying to embarrass and humiliate others. Now, I guarantee theologically I don't agree with a lot of what that, that man said, uh, that Russell Vaught said, but I appreciate the fact that he said, I have to treat everybody with dignity and respect. That's very godly and biblical. But what do we do? In our treating people with dignity and respect, our goal should be we need to be trying to lead people along to firm, logical, rational conclusions regarding religion. Begin sorting through them all and trying to figure out, is there one or some? What should rise above? Which one should stand out above all of the others? How do we do that? How do we conclude which of these many religious beliefs, if any, are the one standard that should be submitted to? I want to give you three questions tonight Three principal questions to, to ask. Whenever you sit down and you're, talking to, you're having discussions either in your own household or with other people uh, about evaluating religion and faith systems in this world, things that we need to ask, things that need to rise, come to the surface and figure out what should rise to the top of all of this heap and this bundle of, of religions we see in the world. And three questions. The first one is this. Does it make sense? Does the faith system make sense? As rational beings, any system that we are going to entrust with the greater existence, with our greater existence, it should be based on rational judgments and arguments. If I'm going to use this base system, this faith system, as the basis for determining everything else I do in my life, I better know that it's rational. I better know and be confident that it's not comprised of stuff that was just grabbed out of the air, out of left field, and thrown together with a bunch of nonsensical ideas. Is the faith system based on verifiable facts and reasonable evidence to draw its conclusions? Or when you read the documents and you hear the stories, are its stories and its details lacking in verifiable evidence? What about its teachings? Are they based on logical, common sense arguments? If I read over here A, and then the next statement I read is B, does that logically conclude C? Or if I begin with Z, Do I have a reasonable X and Y over here to bring me to that point? Now listen, I understand that there are going to be some aspects of every faith system that are inherently unverifiable, like miracles. How are you going to to scientifically verify a miracle? How are you going to archaeologically verify a miracle? You won't. You won't. Because they happened in that moment and then they moved on. 
but even though you're going to have some of those things that can't be verified like you might want to see, there should be other pieces within that system, within those teachings that can be. You should be able to read the history, read the stories, read the teachings, and be able to put those up against history and science and other things, other studies, and, be, and them line up together. And so you need to ask the question, does it make sense? But secondly, you need to ask, does its standard rise above human ability? Every belief system is founded and based upon something. Well, more likely it's based upon someone. There is going to be a group or a person or, or a, a supernatural being that determines what the boundaries, the rules, the rituals, and the principles of that system are. When we sit down and we start evaluating religions, we must consider the source of its ultimate standard. Because quite frankly, there are some measures, some standards that people are going to use that you could never referee. You could never verify it. You could never duplicate it. Such as emotions. A belief system that is, that is based upon how I feel at this moment is never going to be duplicated. Because you may feel great, but you're going to feel lousy. And so it's purely based upon what you think at that time. That's not rising above human standard. I, I can change that to be whatever I want depending upon how much coffee I've had that day. What about situation ethics? The, the idea that, that, okay, there is no ultimate standard, there is no ultimate right here. I'm going to just take every situation and I may have somewhat identical, very similar situations, but right here I may say, yeah, I'm going to tell that lie, but over here I'm not going to tell that lie. Or over here, I'm not going to steal that, but over here I'm going to steal that because in this moment, that's the right thing to do. You can't, base, you can't base a whole system off of situation ethics because the situations are never the same. That's, ba that, that, that's kind of in that idea of truth being relative. How about a deity that constantly changes its mind? It says, for, for one generation of people, this is what I want you to do. And then magically, somewhere along the way, about 15, 20, maybe 50 years later, oh, actually, this is what I want you to do. And it completely contradicts what I said 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Who wants to worship a deity? Who wants to worship a God that you don't know what, is, what He wants at any given point? Who wants to worship a deity that when you stand before Him at the end of time, you're going to say, well, <laughs> sorry, joke's on you. I changed my mind about 15 years ago and you never heard. Does the standard rise above any human ability? Because if we're going to be honest, any reasonable, logical, trustworthy religion must be based on a standard that is above anything that we're going to be able to come up with in our human frailty. But thirdly, does it benefit mankind? Does this religion or faith system actually do something to better the lives and the ultimate existence of humanity? How does this, how does the teaching, how do the teachings of this faith system, how, how does it command its adherents to speak to one another? How, how does it command its followers to physically interact with other people? How does it command its followers to think about other people? Do we try to, do we try to help and elevate and better the lives of the people there? Or do we try, do we try to embarrass? Do we try, to, do, do, do we try to, to, to accuse and to argue with? And heaven forbid, do we try to kill them? Are people and communities and societies better off when they are impacted by the true forms of this religion? Or are they wishing that it had never come around? 
Now, folks, let me, let, let's just state it honestly. I mean, this, this, is, this is where I'm at on it. If, if you can find a religion that meets these three criteria, then you have found a truly legitimate, logical, and necessary faith system. Now, having said that, let me proclaim to you with all conviction that there is only one faith system that fully meets all of these criteria, and that is Christianity as handed down to us through the pages of the New Testament. Consider with me briefly how, how Christianity stacks up to these, to these three questions. Christianity, number one, it makes sense. For one, the Bible stands up to the scrutiny of history and of science over and over again. The details, uh, the, the details contained within those holy pages, they are supported by the things that we discover in the sand. They are supported by the things that we see under the microscope or out in the cosmos. As we studied, we, we had a recent series we called Anatomy of Faith. As we studied in that series, faith is not just blind acceptance of the Bible's words, but faith, rather, is, it is the logical conviction based on the evidence that God has given to us. Add to that the fact that, that when you start looking at the teachings of the Bible, that they are indeed reasonable and sound. They appeal not solely to emotion, although there is a lot of appeal to emotion in the Bible. Do not deny that. But the words of the Bible don't appeal solely to emotion. But it also appeals to our understanding and our logic. Consider what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and I'm reading out of the New American Standard. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Literally that phrase that the, that the New American Standard does as a spiritual service of worship, that phrase means your rational logical act of service or worship. He'll go on and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Christianity as outlined and dictated in the Bible makes sense. But we also find that the God of the Bible is infinitely above all other gods. Yahweh God is the ultimate standard of all authority, the ultimate author of morality and truth. There is no other source outside of Him. Quoting from Robert Vail, uh, uh, he, he was a, a, a district attorney turned gospel preacher. <laughs> How's that for a combination? He wrote an article for, gospel, uh, for uh, Apologetics Press. He made this observation. One of the telltale characteristics of the various religions invented by men down through the years is how their gods tend to reflect and look like the people and the cultures who created them. Go look at all the various world religions. Go look at where they're nestled geographically. And the gods they worship are going to look and think and act an awful lot like those people have for centuries on end before that god ever existed. Or before we have any written record of that god in the pages of history. And yet, the nature and character and work of the God of the Bible, they rise far and above anything that man could create. Folks, I'm telling you something. You go look at all the different characteristics of God. I, I, I really don't believe that, that a group of human beings could manufacture the God of the Bible. I don't think we're smart enough to make up that kind of God. I don't think we're creative enough to make up that kind of a God because He rises above anything that we could do and, and that we could create. And consequently, when you find 
that you have a God who rises above all other gods, and when you have a, a religion in that Christianity makes sense, you're also going to find that Christianity is beneficial to mankind. Wherever its influence goes, mankind benefits. Cultures that are touched by the influence of genuine, real Christianity tend to fare much better than secular societies. Again, so long as they persist in adhering to the Bible principles. Consider very, very briefly that Christianity, when taught and lived out genuinely as God commands it in the Bible, Christianity is the one thing that can give meaning and purpose to the life of a man. By confronting him with the lifetime challenge that he needs in order to find ultimate fulfillment and ultimate happiness. Consider that despite the misunderstandings that are promulgated by our society at large, the Bible, when, when you look at its teachings regarding women, the Bible elevates women to a very high exemplary standard. Go read Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, and look at the characteristics of the virtuous woman as defined and described in God's Word. The Bible is not full of women haters. The Bible lifts women up in high esteem. Children in the pages of the Bible are deemed as having the kind of heart that is fit for the kingdom, full of purity trust and admiration. In the pages of the Bible, the poor, the oppressed, and the downtrodden hold a special place in God's heart. That place is reflected in, in the harvesting laws. The harvesting laws of the Old Testament. God said, you make sure that you leave enough out there for people who don't have fields of their own. And then Matthew 25 I was hungry, you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked and in prison and you clothed me and you came and you visited me. And in Christianity, the imperfect, the broken and lost find their home within true Christianity. Because Christianity is where they find the saving grace of Jesus that can make them whole not something that's going to continue to shun them and castigate them and throw them to the wolves. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, having already acknowledged the brokenness found in the world, Paul rejoiced with his readers when he made the statement, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. No other religion offers that. Christianity is the only faith system that can actually, truly make you a better person. And church, we don't need to be ashamed of or afraid to stand up and make that statement. It's not bigoted to say it. It's not narrow-minded. It's not arrogant. It's a statement of faith. It's logical. It's rational. It's hopeful. It's inspiring. It's truth. God could have left us floundering out here with no hope or light, but He didn't. He gave us light and life and love. He gave us grace. And He preserved a book that would tell us how to be a part of that. And in the midst of all the murky religious waters of this world, that is why we say that here at Highland Heights we are, we are simply trying to be Christians in a very complicated world. And tonight, as we close this out, if you want, no, if you need to know more about that, please ask. Let us tell you about the truth that God has revealed in His Holy Word. Let us tell you about this, the message 
of saving grace found and received through obedient faith in Jesus Christ. Let us tell you about the one true church, the body of God's people that worships together, that works together, that supports together, that is waiting and maturing and growing together as we wait for our Lord Jesus to come take us home. If you need to become a Christian, don't wait any longer. Do it tonight. And if you have need for prayers of forgiveness, strength, courage, or thanksgiving, let us share that with you as well, right now, while we stand and sing.